Welcome back to another episode of Trading Secrets. Today, I am joined by author, entrepreneur, professor, and most notably former member of the FBI, known as the master negotiator, Chris Voss. Chris earned that title throughout his time, serving as the lead crisis negotiator for the New York City Division of the FBI, and then as FBI's chief international hostage and kidnapping negotiator. In 2008, after spending 24 years working 50 150 plus international hostage cases for the FBI, Chris founded the Black Swan Group, which serves as a consulting and training agency for both business and individual negotiating skills. Chris, we are so excited to have you. New York Times bestseller, never split the difference, masterclass expert, the full fee agent, how to stack odds in your favor as a real estate professional. You've done it all. Thank you for being on Trading Secrets. Yeah, man, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me in. It took us a year to get you. You know that? <laughs> a year. We had to fill out. I want to let you guys know we had to fill out packets. We had to interview for this a year. Is it? <laughs> is do you? Is it that tough to get you places? Well, I got I got a, I got a good team, and I'm I'm on the road a lot. You know, training and keynote business is good. Yeah. So they protect my time. I appreciate them. I want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go as a team. I know you got a good team. I like that. I got a good team. And we talked a little behind the scenes. We actually got Voss, is what Chris said. So (laughs) his team, we'll share it more in the recap, but his team used a negotiation tactic on us to make sure this got booked. So we'll talk about that in the recap. Before we do, I want to get your evaluation on something. Never talked about this. But 99% of my podcasts that I go on as a guest, what people do is they say, uh, I'm gonna do the intro after, let's just get right into it. And we just start speaking. One thing I do, over 100 shows, millions of downloads, I always do some sort of introduction. The reason I do an introduction is for twofold. One, I want the guests to feel like pretty good about themselves. Like, hey, I've done this, I've done that, okay, 150 plus negotiations, I feel good. Two, I want them to think like, I did some due diligence, so I feel like I'm in somewhat of a safe space. So that's the psychology of why I do it. Give me the evaluation. Am I on to something, or do you think I'm off? Well, for me, it was a little bit of a warm-up, too. Okay, a warm-up, you know, too. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you get my thoughts going, different things trigger different times. The professor thing jumped out at me. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little bit of an inside joke. Every, You know, everybody on my team, we have a tendency to come up with nicknames for each other. Okay. And, and nickname is is meant to make people feel good yeah you know when I, when I was a cop you came up with a nickname for somebody it was you know it was derogatory you know you're busting their chops you're picking on each other but i my son starts calling me professor my son brandon is running my company you know he helped me build it from the ground up and for all intents and purposes uncredited co-author of the book mm-hmm. but he's calling me professor to take a shot at me Okay, so he's- but nobody knows that Every, everybody thinks that it's it's you know it's meant to be flattering the reason for that was you know, I'm working on kidnapping in Columbia because I don't have time for 20 minute answers. So he'd start talking and I'd go like, OK, professor. And he'd get this big smile on his face because he thought it was flattering and, and, and he'd stop talking because hmm. he wanted to have his intellect be regarded. Yeah. So I call him professor and he'd shut up. And my son knows his story. And when we're working with the team, instead of asking me to shut up, he just say, okay, professor. <laughs> and everybody goes like, oh, a sign of respect. We're all going to call him the professor. And I'm like, you guys don't understand. <laughs> he says this to me to get me to shut up. <laughs> that's amazing. I love. Isn't it funny how like one word someone could interpret it as something totally different just yeah. based on how it's said and when yeah. it's said. It's a good nickname. When, it's, when... it's a good nickname. All right, professor. That's going to be our code word yeah, today. Professor. All right, Chris, we're going to get into negotiation tactics, strategies. If you guys are out there looking to better negotiate with with your partner, with your boss, just anywhere in life, we're going to get to that. Before we do, though, I want to get to your career track. FBI, we've covered almost every industry out there on Trading Secrets. FBI is one we haven't touched. So I'm curious, what is the process to becoming, like to getting an FBI agent license or whatever it is? Like, how do you get into the FBI and how many steps does it take? Yeah, well, when I came in, you put the application in and they started your background. Now, it's a little bit different because they, they understand there's a little bit of a filtering process that they can do early because a lot of people apply that are never going to make it. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, the, the stat that I was told at the time was for about every 10,000 applicants, one gets in. Wow. 
So I, you know, I put in the application, they run a background. They want to run enough of a background on you to know you're going to clear it, that you get eligible for security clearance. I mean, as high as it gets above top secret, ultimately. And then they, then they do, if you clear the background, they do an interview process. Okay. And then if you do the, at the time, you didn't have to clear the physical before you got to Quantico. So they give you a chance to get in shape there. They don't do that anymore. You got you. You have to meet all the physical minimums before you even get there. Which are what at this point? You know, it's not that bad. You got to be in pretty decent shape. Okay. You know, you got to be able to run a, a mile and a half in in a reasonable time. Okay. You got to do a reasonable amount of sit ups and push ups and pull ups. Okay. And they just it they found it was a lot easier to not even let you walk through the door. More recently, when when I got there, there were some people that were not in shape, and and they worked really hard, and they got in shape there, and they cleared the, cleared the physical minimums. But the interview process is really the most important thing. They want to see if you know who you are matches your resume, and then if you clear the interview, then 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 you're there. I heard rumors that they do a lie detector test, and there are questions like if you have smoked weed more than like seven times or something, you're out. But if it's under seven times you're eligible like are there weird rules like that or are those all rumors? well i don't know i don't know that that's, a, that's all that weird you know it, it's it's hard to put an arbitrary number on the number of times you smoked weed yeah especially in today's day and age when it's be, been decriminalized sure and it's all it's always it's always more context yeah like i did i did a internship i grew up in iowa small town iowa boy yeah. with iowa department of public safety and at the time, they told me that, like, look, you can smoke weed a few times. You want to be in law enforcement. And everybody experiments with it at some point in time. It's mm -hmm. silly to think that you didn't. Right. Don't ever touch cocaine. You know, don't ever, don't, yeah, or anything worse. Yeah. And I thought, like, all right, you know, tell me what the rules are. Tell me what the parameters are. And I'm good with that. So did you smoke weed or did you lie about it? Like they're more interested in whether or not you're going to lie about something, okay? Than in what you did, or it, was there? Everybody's got a period of time when they did stupid stuff. It's kind mm -hmm. of the definition of growing up, right? Do Do you lie about it? Is Is really the biggest issue? Okay, so that one in ten thousand, they want to know if you lie about these things. They want to know all about your background. You get in. Then when you get in. We talk a lot about pay transparency. I read on the internet, you started around 50000 Is that a fair number from a starting salary in the FBI? Oh, it's probably higher than that. Okay. It, it, it was, that was, that was ballpark where it was at the time when I came in last century. Okay. <laughs> I'm a last century dude. Yeah. But it's it's pretty good pay. For federal law enforcement, the, the base that the FBI starts on it is higher than Secret Service, DEA, any of the other federal agencies. So the, the base for FBI agents starts higher. You know, the journeyman steps, if you will, caps out a little higher. Okay. But then you start getting into SES senior executive service. There's a cap on what those guys make wherever they are. Okay. So they all cap out at the top end if you're if you're in executive management, which I I technically was at the end, but I always worked for a living, if you if you will. Yeah, understood, understood. <laughs> All right, Chief International Hostage and Kidnapping Negotiator. I want to back up before you got into the negotiating group. You're with the FBI. I right. heard you do an interview about a story where you're knocking on a woman's door to get into this group. She said no. Oh, she yeah, said yeah. no. She said no. Right. And then she said, and you said, well, what can I do to increase my likelihood of getting in the negotiating group? And she said, go volunteer at the suicide prevention hotline right go, go spend some time there yeah. and you did it and you came back to her and my understanding from your story is that she said all right you're in you're only one of two people that had done that right which got you in in that story i'm curious do you think it was the experience of actually being in and in, in volunteering for suicide prevention groups or do you think it was the actual action of doing something that she had requested and so many people not following through. Yeah, it's both. Initiative and instruction. Okay. Do you take initiative? Do you take instruction? Like I already, I, I always took that completely for granted. And it's ridiculously rare, which to me boggles my mind. It's, it's actually how I got in the FBI 
in hindsight, I look back on that. Any, any key period of time in my life, ask somebody, you should ask, you know, and never take advice from somebody who you wouldn't trade places with or hasn't been where you're going. Don't take advice from anybody else. But if you would trade places with them or they've been where you're going, they know what they're talking about. So ask them for advice, but then also follow it. Like a ton of people ask for advice, and if the advice doesn't fit their game plan, they're like, I don't want to do this. You know, I, I asked her what to do. It's initiative and instruction. You know, do you take initiative? Do you listen? Are you smart enough to listen to the people you should listen to? Also, you kind of find out the hard way who you shouldn't listen to. You know, and that's why if, look, if they, if, if they haven't been where you're going, you know, I, I'm, I'm listening to an interview not long ago and, and the guy was talking about who to take advice from because I'm, I'm very, I say, don't listen to critics, don't take advice if they don't know what they're talking about. Somebody put a post on my Instagram, well, like, it's possible that they might be right. Yeah. And this guy in this interview says, look, if you're flying an airplane in a storm and you're worried about crashing, and somebody comes up from the back, the passenger section, wants to give you advice on how to fly in a storm. Like, that dude might be right. <laughs> but you're not listening. But don't listen. <laughs> you know, you a pilot. Have you flown in a storm? Yeah, man. I'm right, but I got ideas anyway. Like, you know, you're going to crash. Yeah. But find out if they if they know what they're, they're talking about. Otherwise, the fact that somebody might be right is not worth risking your career over. But if 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 they've been where you're going, you better pay attention because if you don't, they're going to notice. And then they are going to talk about you as someone who doesn't listen. And mm -hmm. that's going to kill you. And we're going to get to listening and the power of listening in negotiation. I think that's a great piece of advice, though. Listen to those who have been there. You did. You got into the negotiation yeah, group. Yeah. You worked your way up and you've been involved in over 150 really, really wild hostage situations. Now, I want to ask you about a specific one. So you were involved in monitoring the New York City landmark bomb plot after and it was three years of investigating the 1993 World Trade bombing. So you're yeah. one of 500 agents involved in this task. Ask. When you go back to those days and you think about the work you're doing and after that event, were there suspicions that something like 9-11 could happen after what you had already investigated and spent time on? No, not for me at the time. You know, the, the New York office was working bin Laden hard when 9-11 when hit. Um, it was actually, there was a wrestling match. 9-11 happens, we got a brand new director of the FBI, Robert Mueller, who, by the way, was a very good director of the FBI. You know, you could, uh, you know, the Trump investigation after the fact, the Mueller report, you mm -hmm. can take whatever point of view you want on that. Um, but he did a good job for the FBI. Anyway, dude's brand new. Like, he, he has been on the job six months. Mm -hmm. Louis Free is just out the door. And bang, 9-11 happens. So, first of all, talking about splitting the FBI... Homeland Security got created as a result. Compromise, compromises are always bad. Home, Homeland Security was this mismatch that they threw together. They're still trying to straighten out. Mm -hmm. But Mueller's on a job, and the New York office is on top of bin Laden as much as possible through the African em embassy bombings and getting pushback from everybody. Agency is not cooperating. Agency is keeping the information to themselves. And they haven't hit here. And the U.S. government at the time is only in really interested in terrorist events that have happened here. So there's mm. tons of obstruction. Mueller's in charge. It gets pointed at bin Laden really early on. And the New York office is on the case and they're running it. And they're ready to go after him. And Mueller's like, but headquarters is supposed to be in charge. So he's like, okay, I'll just transfer New York to Washington, D.C. And <laughs> he brings, just transfers the leadership and, and the agents, and, and they all come down, and then they, they get on top of it. And, you know, the the obstruction, in intergovernment obstruction, turf battles. So, you know, there were indicators within the U.S. government that this plot might be happening. Huh. But the, the interagency idiocy. Yeah. 
is obstructing the government's ability to get on top of it. So, and I remember shortly after the First World Trade Center bombing, it, there were a lot of people that were predicting this going to happen again. You got we got to be ready if something like this happens again. And I remember the first year or two thinking, look, we wiped these guys out. Yeah. I mean, we took out their leadership, we took out their operators. In point of fact, the fact that we took out their leadership opened the room for bin Laden to move into power. The guy that that we locked up that was in a leadership role was a competitor for the leadership to bin laden interesting and by us throwing him in, in jail the blind shake it cleared the way for bin laden to move into a leadership position those two, those two guys were effectively rivals wow and so we took him and, and his people out and a vacuum got created and it was overseas and afghanistan and the u.s didn't care about afghanistan at the time you know, it was, and so it gave him a place to flourish and, and run things. And, and we got, we got, they got our attention when they hit us again here. Interesting. So wiping out essentially his biggest enemy and then some obstruction within our own internal system potentially led to what happened. That is wild information. I got to ask you about 150 plus hostage situations. When you look back at your career, what was probably like, would you say the worst case scenario of those situations? And what was your biggest negotiating learning lesson? Well, you know, there were, there were, you know, to quote the great Irish philosopher, yeah. Colin McGregor. <laughs> what a legend. I, I win or I learn. Yeah. You know, so success is a very gratifying. You don't win every time. Yeah. Uh, but you learn a lot from the th stuff that goes bad yeah. or the stuff that goes bad unexpectedly. Most of the time it's getting ready to go bad. You got you got you got an idea it's going bad early on. Al Qaeda in 2004 ish time frame was murdering people on camera and turning the tide on that took months. And we knew that we were turning the tide, but not quickly enough to save some people's lives. Yeah. And, from the, from the beginning on several of those cases, like every indicator was that they were going to kill him. And it's very hard to work a case knowing it's going bad. Yeah. A couple of, a couple of years earlier than that, I'm working a case in the Philippines, a Burnham Sabero case. Martin and Gratian Burnham, Guillermo Sabero, three Americans that got grabbed with a bunch of other Filipinos. And that thing was a train wreck from the beginning. And it, there, there were times, though, that we thought that we were going to get them out just for it went really bad at the end. It lasted 13 months, about three months in advance of that. Not only did we think we were going to get them out, some of the bad guys that the family members' reps were talking to were coaching family member representatives, coaching behind the scenes. Even the bad guys, some of the bad guys thought they were coming out, thought we had a deal, and they had an internal double cross wow. internally. And that went bad. Two out of, Guillermo Sabrero was murdered about three weeks into the beginning of the case. And then at the very end of it, after a number of Filipinos had both been murdered and released, there was a botched rescue attempt where Martin Burnham was shot and killed by friendly fire and Gracia wow. Burnham was, was wounded. And that, that was the worst moment of my professional career. For a while, I used to, I, I felt sorry for myself and I thought it was the worst moment of my career. And then I thought, to me, this was a job. This wasn't my father that got killed. Yeah. And I and I felt I was a little ashamed of myself for feeling sorry for myself. Yeah. But we thought that case was going to turn, and we learned a lot from it. Yeah. You know, that, that, that went bad unexpectedly, and then we had to get better. When you look at it, of course, so many uncontrol— When you look at it, of course, so many uncontrollables, but is there— what would you say the number one takeaway is from the learning lessons from a negotiation standpoint within that case? It was, you know, it's probably one of the things that's informed our, our teaching people in business negotiation more than anything else. And a phrase that we came out of it with, there's always a team on the other side. There's always a deal killer on the other side. Everybody's way into talking to the decision maker. When a point of fact, the deal killer, the obstructionist who's not coming to the table will kill at least 50% of the deals. The deal killer is as important, if not more important, than the decision maker. And, and the deal killer 
killed us in that deal because they were unsatisfied. They weren't involved in the negotiations directly. And this person consequently had an interest in making his internal competitor look bad. Mm -hmm. So, and he was offended that he wasn't involved in the negotiations. So what he did was he sat back and when a deal had apparently been struck, then on his side of the table, he torpedoed the deal. He und under undermined it. And a number of years ago, what's the analogy to the business world? A number of years ago, we were in competition, if you will, for a negotiation contract for a major telecommunications provider, you know, one of the big companies that still gives you cell phone service. Right. And, we heard, and we heard that fully 50% of the deals that they sign are never implemented. Hmm. Deal killers. Mm -hmm. People on their side of the table, point of contact for the company, cuts a deal. And they got all kind of nonsense terms. Like everybody knows when after deal is signed, when it goes into the terms and conditions phase, yep. it might not come out. Mm -hmm. You know, those are deal killers on the other side. How do you account for those people? How do you get them involved? How do you communicate through your point of contact so that even though they're not coming to the table, they feel invested in the deal and they don't kill it? And so that was that was the big takeaway from that case because the negotiator we were coaching had a great relationship, if you can imagine, having a great relationship with a kidnapper. Mm -hmm. But they had a great professional working relationship. They actually joked with each other on the phone. Yeah. And that person was embarrassed when the deal didn't go through. We thought just because we had a great relationship with a person we were talking to, that was enough to make the deal. Mm -hmm. And we assessed the person we were talking to as being genuine, and he was. And he was embarrassed personally when the deal didn't go through. And, you know, any business deal, you, you're buying a house. Yeah. You're sitting there, husband and wife. And the husband is like, I'm a decision maker. And the wife's sitting there not saying a word. The wife is the, the most killer. important person. <laughs> you know, there, 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 ain't, there ain't anybody that's a decision maker by themselves. Everybody's got a trusted advisor they listen to. It does not matter what the negotiation is. Guy buying a car. And anybody. Yeah, they got a they got a they got a brother in law. They got a father. They got a parent. They got a sibling. They got a significant other. They're not going through in that until they've listened to their trusted advisors, who are staying out of it, and watching it go down, and either liking or disliking a point of contact on the other side, and yeah. killing a deal if if you don't respect them. Yeah, you, you know, you real estate salesperson. If she's ignoring the significant other that ain't saying a word, he or she is the agent. Like that person who's watching is rightfully going to be offended. Yeah. So the, the deal killer is extremely important. It's intriguing to see the parallels from a real estate transaction to also dealing with terrorists and knowing that they those are true parallels, deal yeah. killers. Human nature. And when you're here, guys, just hang tight because I'm going to get into more of those parallels that you can take into your everyday life. I just have a few more questions that relates to the FBI stuff, especially with negotiation, because from these experiences that we don't hear, we can learn so much. But you talked about deal, kill deal killers and how that hostage situation was one of the worst moments in your professional career. That's not as highly publicized. Like Those are stories we don't hear, but one we always hear about documentaries, series, is Waco, right? Oh, yeah. 82 people killed. We've seen it on every single streaming service right. over and over. And David Koresh, right? He was the deal maker. He was the decision maker. When you analyze that as a professional negotiator, top negotiator for the FBI, what would you have done differently that wasn't done there? See, while Waco was going on, we were up to our eyeballs in New York City with the first World Trade Center bombing. Yeah. First, I think Waco initiated with the ATF on February 24th. First World Trade Center bombing was February 26th. Like, they were almost simultaneously. Interesting. And it didn't turn into an FBI siege until after the first World Trade Center bombing. And so, I, otherwise, I'd have been at Waco because I was you a hostage been there, negotiator. Huh? And my former boss was running the operation. Wow. And the real problem there, the, the documentary that I've seen, the only one I've seen on it, that my boss was in, Gary Nessner, 
uh, Netflix American Apocalypse, which is fair. You know, it's a it's a very fair documentary, and to and to watch it, if you understand the holes that have been left out, it's fair. You know, what do you want from a documentary? You don't want it to really point the finger at anybody. You want it to lay things out in a fair fashion and then help you understand. Yeah. So first of all, Koresh was never coming out, ever, period. No matter what. No matter what, because he was, Koresh was 33 years old. He, uh, complete sociopath, in my opinion, did not believe he was the son of God, but portrayed everybody that he was. And when Christ was crucified, Christ was 33. So Koresh cannot come out. He, if he comes out, he's a fraud. He's, he's by definition, Jesus Christ didn't live to be 34. Koresh got to die at age 33 if he's cornered in that position. As a matter of fact, I think it was probably always his intention to die at that age because the myth that he created required him to die at age 33. So then the real issue is, was the way that the, the Bureau brought it to an end stupid? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Could they have gotten more people out than they did? There was a tremendous internal disagreement as to the approach. And my former boss, Gary, who wanted to continue with the negotiation strategy that was not heavy handed, got kicked out of Waco because he was so adamant about we do not need to crank up the pressure on these people. If, you know, some people would say, yeah, you know, well, you're kissing their ass. Mm hmm. Well, if people are coming out by kissing their ass, I'll kiss their ass. <laughs> continue to kiss their ass. We're still getting people out just because we're never going to get Koresh out and you, and you never were. And a, n a number of other things happened behind the scenes. A hostage negotiator who's, who's since deceased, Byron Sage, who was also a friend of mine, was principally the one that spoke to him. And there was a point in time, for example, that Byron connected with Koresh's number two guy. And I know this because Byron has told me about it, plus there were overhears on the inside. So Byron meets, I can't remember the dude's name, but he meets him face-to-face -face outside. They do they do a face-to-face. -face. Byron goes forward, HRT's covering him, and they meet face-to-face. -face. And this guy goes back inside, and he literally says to Koresh, Byron Sage is an honest man. We can trust him. Koresh never allows his number two guy to speak to Byron again. And that tells you everything. At any given point in time, when Koresh felt the government was gaining the upper hand, then Koresh blocked it, obstructed it. He he did a, he did a number of things to stop the internal bleeding. Another thing that was not in the documentary, but that I know happened. Yeah. Because in the documentary, they showed that the bureau was filming the hostage people that came out to prove that they were good, treating them with respect. Right kids they're they're filming the kids they're filming the adults and they're sending the films back inside and koresh is telling his people oh when you get out they're going to handcuff you they're going to beat you they're going to abuse you they're going to do all these horrible things to you they're going to abuse you and so gary says all right you know what uh, we'll film the people we'll we'll show you a video of them being treated with respect like even if we put them in handcuffs We'll do it respectfully. We'll prove to you that David is lying to you. So the last person that came out, this particular individual comes out and he says, I refuse to be videotaped. Oh, Koresh sends this dude out with the explicit instructions to refuse to be videotaped so that then he could say, hey, you know, what happened to Bobby? You know, we ain't got no video of Bobby. They must be lying to you about how they're treated. Bobby's the last guy to come out, and there's no proof that he's being treated well. So there were a lot of things like that that were going back and forth, gamesmanship that Koresh was doing to keep people from coming out. And he was 33 when the thing went down. If you're Jesus, you got to die at age 33. Interesting. I mean, like, just disgusting manipulation, and it's – 
highest form and yeah. then to see the result of it, 82 people killed. Is it fair to say that some situations, especially like that one, you just can't negotiate? Yeah, yeah, a thousand percent. And that's the first recognition. Like, And when a Burnham case went down, I've been repeating a phrase that Gary had been telling me for years, best chance of success. And then I realized like, oh, by definition, that means there's no guarantee of success. Just what we're doing works better than anything else does. And when I'm teaching business negotiation now, I tell people like, if you got some negotiation guru out there that's guaranteeing you success, walk away. That nothing works all the time. What you need is what works more than anything else does. Also, there are alternative ways of success. Just because it's good doesn't mean it's the best. Just because you succeed some of the time doesn't mean your batting average is as high as it should be. That's, a, that's another thing that's hard to get some people out of. But best chance of success. As a general rule, hostage negotiators is, are successful 93% of the time. Domestic or international, that's a pretty good number, which means 7% of the time things going bad. Another thing that, that Gary taught us that I'm grateful for, which I've applied to the business world, he said, all right, so if it's going to go bad, they're probably earmarks, clusters of behavior he used to refer to it as. The behaviors probably fits a pattern. The pattern might be recognizable. And he came up with a, a block of instruction. High risk indicators. Look for these nine signs. You got any one of these nine signs, you better be prepared for the fact this could be one of the 7%. And we teach people that in business. Like there's some people you're never going to make the deal with. It's not a sin to not get the deal. It's a sin to take a long time to not get the deal. Look for, And then when you look for the patterns of behavior, they start jumping out at you. You can pick it up very early on and recognize that this is never going to happen. What are those nine signs? The biggest one in business is when the other side is overly focused on one single term. They are shopping you. We have a phrase, the favorite and the fool, or proof of life. Proof of life in hostage negotiation, do the bad guys have the hostage? And are they going to give them to you? Is the hostage alive? Are they going to make a deal with you? It's two very distinctive concepts. Hostage could be alive. They might not have any intention of giving them to you. They might not have the hostage. There are criminal gangs in several parts of the world that are famous for finding out if somebody's been kidnapped and then calling the victim's family claiming to have the hostage. So do they have the hostage? Is the hostage alive? Are they going to give them to you? Business, there's due diligence. Mm -hmm. there's low bid. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't know who the, if, if, if you don't know who the fool in the game is, it's probably you. They've been, they, they got somebody they want to do business with. They've been told from the boss to get competing bids. You know, don't go with this company, but find out what they have to say. Cause they might tell you something. Mm -hmm. That's the fool in the game. So they're overly fixed on price. They're overly fixated on one specific aspect of the entire package. They're most likely shopping you. And they have a favorite and you are not it. So in, in real estate, you know, I mean, pick a business everywhere. There's always somebody that there is their favorite. That's mm -hmm. human nature. They've picked out a short list. They've done a lot of research. They've focused in on one particular provider. And they would like that provider to cut their price. But for other reasons, they don't have to have it done. Because that provider has won a beauty contest already in advance for other reasons. So if they're talking to you, they really, really, really just want your price. Or they really, really want to know how you're going to deliver. Mm hmm then you're being shopped. But if you're talented enough to identify that, that right. you're in the 7%, that you are being shopped, that you do have a David Koresh who you know isn't coming out, or you have someone that is just shopping you and they know they're not going to buy from you, if you're good enough to identify it, or if you're in a conversation like a relationship and you know you're just not going to win the argument, you've identified that 7%. Right. 
the big question is, what do you do? Because huh. in Waco, yep. they went and destroyed. In some situations, it blows up. What do you do in that 7%? Yeah. All right. So we'll separate the Waco issue. What you know? What might have been done differently in Waco? Separate it out from business scenarios. Okay. Because you know, doing things differently doesn't necessarily mean it's going to change things. You know, if I were to do Waco differently, does that mean that more people come out? There's no way of knowing that, especially yeah. since Koresh engineered things. So he was not coming out, and he was doing everything good to keep anybody else from coming out too. But in business, we live by what we like to call the Oprah rule. The Oprah rule. The Oprah rule. And that is the only non-hostage negotiation term that we use. I could call it the Chase Bank rule. I could call it the Hugh McGowan rule. Because I learned it first at the Chase Bank under the guidance of then NYPD hostage negotiation commander, Lieutenant Hugh McGowan. Very talented dude. They go to put me on a phone in the Chase Bank. It's been stuck. It's not going anywhere. We're about five hours in, complete stalemate. McGowan goes to put me on the phone. He says, now I want you to control how every conversation ends. And the Oprah rule is the last impression is the lasting impression. Hmm. The most important impression, how you take over any conversation is how it ends. Because how the last conversation ends sets up the next conversation. First impression is almost a complete throwaway. Wow. I've never heard that. Yeah. It's the first you know I mean? time I've ever heard that. Last impression is a lasting impression. And I'm talking this through a couple of years ago with Cindy Mori, who was Oprah's booker at the time. We're kicking stuff around. Her and I have both spoken on a panel in Chicago. And she's like, yeah. She says, that's Oprah's rule forever. Like in the entertainment business, it's usually in in a limo, out in a taxi. You know, they treat you great up front, all this fanfare. Hey, yeah. how can I have you see? You know, you show up on a show, you do whatever you think. And then they say goodbye. And you go out and, and they they took you there in a limo, but they you got to go out in the street and hail down a taxi to get out of there. And she says, Oprah, oh, at Oprah, it's in a limo, on a limo. She said, when Oprah has made sure that no matter what happens, no matter how it's gone, even if there's an argument, people will feel loved and valued especially when they walk out the door. Hmm. And I have had some conversations relayed to me in very specific terms from very reliable sources of Oprah taking people to the woodshed over their behavior. And at the end, she always finished with like, you know, I will always love you. Wow. I will always be supportive of you. The decision of what you do here is completely up to you. If you decide not to do the show, you have my undying love, devotion, and support for the rest of your life. Wow. The last impression is a lasting impression. And so if you if you end positively, you know, your original question, you got a seven percenter. Somebody's yeah. never gonna make the deal with. Yeah. Most people would finish that conversation with a cheap shot. Of course. The last impression is a lasting impression. Or ghost or just like I'm or done ghost. with you or whatever. We, we counsel people to figure it out early on and then say, and I have said this to clients. I've said, when you're ready to make a mutual commitment, we will be there for you for the next 20 years. I would love for today to be, be the day you look back on 20 years from now and say that was the beginning of an amazing relationship. And when you're ready to make a mutual commitment, we will be there for you. And we'll talk to you when that day comes. It's interesting just how my body and brain responds to you giving that example. Like I'm just put like I'm like feeling warm just thinking about that. So if you use that example in a real negotiation in real life, right. think about the impact it'll have or the Oprah scenario. Just you explaining it. Yeah. I felt like warm by it. Like I'm like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, it's a perfect transition. We're gonna put FBI FBI behind us. Everyone's been waiting for this moment because they're like, okay, this is the stuff I could take to my life. I want to talk about negotiation in two ways. I want to talk about the words that we can use and the tactics. Right. And then I'll talk about everything else. Right. Let's start with everything else. Let's start with body language. In a meeting, in an interview, in a sales pitch, in anything, a date. 
what are some things to be aware of? I'm, th- I'm sitting here thinking, I've never thought about my body language, but because I'm with you, I'm thinking, and, and you and Daniel Negreanu, because he's a poker player, I'm thinking, am I sitting back too much? Am I sitting, right, or how, right, do I, right. how do I act? What is your take on overall body language when entering a discussion of negotiation? I mean, your inner voice betrays your outer voice. Your inner mindset betrays your body language. You know, just be curious and attentive. And your body language will take care of itself. You don't have to, you know, there's this this nonsense about mirroring the other person's body language. You know, take the same pose they do. The manipulators do that. Now, your body language may fall into place with the other person, and you may end up physically mimicking each other some. I actually try not to do that because the manipulators do it. Mm-hmm. Now, every now and then I'll find myself falling in line with somebody because I'm really attentive. Sure. And if you're actually attentive, your body language often will intent- tend to start to line up. But if you're just really genuinely curious, that'll take care of everything because then you're going to contemplate what people say. Yeah. You know, how often should you lock eyes? How yeah. often should you look away? Yeah. Well, when you're thinking about what somebody says, you're going to break eye contact. Yeah. Because and then then whatever your natural thinking pose is, looking up to the left, looking up to the right, looking down. Everybody's got their own contemplative look. So just just be genuinely curious. Now, curiosity is is might be the hack, okay. the mechanism. A guy who's I've uh, read a, a lot of his stuff. Seem Nicholas Tyler wrote The Black Swan. He also wrote, which inspired the name of my company, by the way, his example of what a black swan was, the impact of the highly improbable. He borrowed it from European phrase. It was a great example for, for my company. He also wrote a book called Anti-Fragile, okay. which is fascinating. He coined the term. He says, being curious is an anti-fragile characteristic. In my company, we've always talked about curiosity as a superpower. You can't be angry and curious at the same time. It's impossible. Mm. You're in a positive frame of mind. You're 31% smarter in a positive frame of mind, which means you hear more. You're more mentally agile. You see patterns quickly. You have more mental endurance in a positive frame of mind. The mindset of flow is a human performance at its highest ability is highly positive. So when you're genuinely curious, you're listening, you're contemplating, you're thinking about what the other side's saying. Your body language is ridiculously encouraging. You'll tilt your head slightly to the side. You'll raise eyebrows at different times. The other side will see that you're actually listening. Hmm. So short answer is if you're genuinely curious, almost everything else is going to fall into line naturally. Okay. That's fascinating. I like that. Don't overthink that. If you're genuinely curious, the rest will come. You had mentioned positivity, 31%. What was the exact Yeah, Sean Acker, Harvard psychologist, did a TED Talk called, I think, The Happy Secret to Better Work. Highly entertaining TED Talk. Of of course, since he's preaching positivity, one would expect him to be funny. Imagine that. And that's where I got that stat. I'm satisfied by the source. Data statistics. Sure. All data is flawed. All data is flawed. Period. Yeah. So then all you have to do is find out the source of the data and how they collected it and make up your own mind as to whether or not you like it. But knowing that, how do you get someone to start thinking positive about you if that's going to positively influence the outcome? Right. All right. So being genuinely curious, emotion is cont- emotions have contagion. For neuroscience reasons, not for psychology reasons. Okay. So if you're in a positive, if you have a positive demeanor, that's going to be contagious. If I smile at you, if you hear my smile, there will be a neurochemical change in your brain, which means it's involuntary, which is going to lean you in a positive direction. When somebody smiles at us and we smile back, we don't choose to smile. Hmm. The smile actually got triggered inside of us. Your tone of voice is going to impact somebody's velocity of thought. So when you're positive, when you're likable, 
that's going to be contagious. And that there's a real fine line there that's tremendous to understand. You don't have to be liked. Like a lot of people, like I'm, I might be determined that you got to like me. I've taken myself hostage. If I'm likable, if I'm charming, if I'm trying to win you over, I might not win you over. That could throw me off my game. There's some very predatory people that understand if I just act like I don't like you, you're going to start giving in. So there's a difference between being like a bull and needing to be liked. To be curious in what somebody say, says makes you highly likable. Hmm. There's an emotional contagion of positivity back and forth. So if you maintain a positive demeanor, it's going to seep into the other side. If you're relentlessly positive, you can even win over somebody who's trying really hard to be negative. They can't help themselves because it's a neurochemical reaction. Interesting. You said tone. Tell me a little bit about tone and inflection and how people should think about it when they're negotiating. Yeah, I, you know, we think that tone has five times the impact of the actual words. Wow. And if you start, if you open your mind to being, recognizing the, the data in the world, it's pretty clear. A lot of people put a number of different ratios on how much is tone, how much is body language, how much is the word choice. And I get people arguing with me all the time over this. And it, they're usually people who put a lot of effort into their words. And they love their words to be precise. If they're, if they're an academic and they write for a living, mm -hmm. then their word choice, they're like, well, my word choice is far more important than tone. And I can say, all right, so here's an example. I can say, wow, that was an insightful remark. And you're going to feel my regard and respect for you and my genuine consideration of the remark. Mm -hmm. And I could go, wow, that was an insightful remark. Totally. And that was derogatory. Totally. I got a 180 degree turn in the meaning using the exact same words. So tone is, tone's a game changer. How do you calm yourself down in situations where you want where your tone naturally wants to take over yeah. i want to yell yeah. but in my yeah. head i have to calm down what are tricks you use you can think of a couple of different ways i i think of it as priming a pump like if, if i've got myself already in like a playful enjoyable likable demeanor and i'm sort of i'm sort of in that game for the day that'll carry me through because i get triggered by some people yeah and I'm a naturally aggressive person. About a third of us are. And so if my natural tone of voice is uh, I sound like I'm either angry with you or I think you're stupid. You know, my, my son, Brandon, again, you know, he, he had a funny imitation of me. He says, all right, this is Chris Voss. This is what Chris Voss would say. I'm not that smart, but I'm smarter than you, and that makes you an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. No, Nailed I do, it. <laughs> I do that with my tone of voice. But so the other day, for whatever reason, I'm in a pretty playful mood. I'm in a good mood. Like playful, like you can get away with good stuff, playful. So one of my pet peeves, I always sit on the aisle in the plane. Same. Always business class. And by, by As a general rule, business class people I found to be ruder than people in coach and economy. I think that's fair. And coach and economy, you know, they're kind of, we're all in this together. You know, we got to be nice to each other. Like I've never, I've almost never had anybody be openly rude to me in economy. And it happens in business class all the time. Yeah. Somebody in business class are like, you know, I'm a success. I want my space. Yeah. <laughs> so the window seat, typically the middle area between the two seats for the leg room, that's my space. And the window seat guys, since they can't get up and get to the overhead, They'll, they'll knock themselves out to get on a plane ahead of you so they can throw their bag in your leg room mm -hmm. and expect you to say, to complain. I do. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm not thinking about it the other day and, and I jump on a plane and dude's already in there. He's got his bag in my leg room and I don't notice it until I put my leg down and, and I got a bad right knee so it, 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 it automatically sort of hits my knee wrong. I hit the, and I go, Oh, wow, I guess that's in my leg room. And I say it like that. When, and my natural tone of voice would have been, that's in my leg room, which would have been like confrontational, yeah, would have caused a problem. But since I said it jokingly, 
you know, this guy just, I didn't even ask him to move it. It just, it, my tone of voice hits him right. And I see him physically shift and sort of wake up because he knows what he's done to me. Yeah. And he just leans down, he picks up the bag and he moves it. So the tone can get you what you want. Playful tone of voice, confrontational words, but a playful tone of voice with somebody who knows he's intruding and he just leans down and he moves it back. Interesting. And another tactic you will use to kind of bring people down is you'll say your name, right? If there's confrontation yeah. or aggression, one of the things you recommend is instantly can diffuse a situation by just saying your name so that they have a personal connection to you. Your name, like, and, and that's what people get wrong in business all the time too, because they're like, they want to learn your name and they want to batter you with your name. Hey, Chris. Chris, 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 Chris. Yeah, Chris, yeah, Chris. over and over and over. The manipulative types do that. But if I give you my name, mm -hmm. then I allow you to choose or not to give me your name. And the mere fact that it's your choice. I don't ask you for your name. I go, hey, I'm Chris. And I let you fill the space. If you don't give me your name further on down, I might ask, but I let it be voluntary as to whether or not, because your name is very precious to you. And I don't want you to feel like I pried it out of you. Now, if you've given it to me, I'm going to appreciate it. I'm going to work hard to remember what it is. I'm going to love to find out what's unique about it. You know, somebody in your family, that name. Your parents picked that name for a reason. And you know what it is. And I'm going to appreciate it if you give me the opportunity. So you're not going to ask for it. You're no. going to just put your name out. I'm Chris, I'm Chris, and then you'll give them the opportunity to give it to you. Yeah. And if and they, they give it give to it you, not. it's a sign of somewhat of peace or whatever. Right, yeah. right. But even if they don't give it to me, I become a human being. Yeah. Like I've confronted people in some volatile confrontations, sure. either with me or in near me. Yeah. And I'll, I give my name and let it go. And then I go from being some nameless person they could have a confrontation with okay. to being Chris. And it's harder to hurt Chris than it is a person. Well, I, you know, a couple of years ago, we're in a bar. The young lady that I'm with, business colleague, you know, this it's a crowded bar, and she's really nice. And a dude behind her just keeps sort of intruding on her space, and she keeps kind of getting shoved over in my direction. We're trying to have a business conversation, and I see kind of a distressed look on her face, and she's like, "Like this guy just keeps, just keeps shoving me." So all right, I'll take care of this. And I tap the dude on his shoulder. Pretty hard tap. Mm -hmm. And he spins around, you know, expecting to be confronted because he's been pushing and he knows he has. Yeah. And when he spins around and looks at me, I go, I'm Chris. With that tone? Yeah. I go, I'm sorry. We need our space. At that and, speed? Yeah. Because I feel calm right now. Yeah. And, and he's like, oh, 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 I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Now he knew. He felt like probably he's getting shoved from the other side. But I never I never got his name. Never asked him for it. But, you know, I, I, before I'm this nameless jerk in a bar, and now I'm Chris. And he's like, oh, okay. And you got your space. Yeah. Which is all yeah. you wanted. Yeah. What about this one? time of day. I just had a friend tell me that he was consulted by this big, famous, expensive HR consultant that he had to fire someone. It had to be at 4 p.m. on Friday. Oh. And I'm just curious of psychology of time of day with anything, saying yes, saying no, asking for something, firing someone. Are there any stats or theories on time of day? So, all right. So he's asking for good reasons. The HR person, that's horrible advice. <laughs> Another misconception. Four o'clock debunked. Four, four o'clock on a Friday is a coward's firing. I mean, that a lot of people do something where they say, Well, I'm trying to do it, be nice to you, when in point of fact you're trying to save yourself. Interesting. Now I've fired people and we've we've had these conversations. And somebody who really cared about people said, Look, you fire somebody on a Friday, you have ruined their whole weekend. What are they supposed to do? other than go in a tank and feel horrible because they can't they can't do anything on on 
four o'clock on a Friday. How, how are they going to salvage their life? Yeah. He said, you know, you think that you're doing them a favor. You're saving yourself by firing them on a Friday. Fire them on Monday. You think it's a horrible way to start the week. In point of fact, it's their best advantage to get back up on their feet. Hmm. It's the beginning of the week. They ain't gonna, nobody likes to get fired anyway. Give them, fire them when they got a chance to pick their life back up immediately. First thing on a Monday morning. To you, it sounds like a horrible way to start the week. To them, how difficult it is, they get back on their feet as soon as they're ready. You fire somebody on a Friday, they got to they gotta live with that for two days. Mm. They can't do anything about that. Mm. Don't fire somebody on a Friday. Fire them on a Monday. Interesting. But, but that, who are you really trying to save with that? You're trying to save, save yourself. Save yourself. It's a coward move. I love that. It's good advice. But there is something with the Black Swan Group that also says, if you're looking for a, tell me a little bit more. If you're looking for a yes, you want to ask before 1 p.m.? Or was it rephrasing a question because people are most comfortable saying no? To yeah, we're out of yes? the yes business. We don't ask people to say yes ever, 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 ever. And why is that? Because yes is typically, there's, first of all, there's three kind of yeses, commitment, confirmation, and counterfeit. Now, the vast majority of yeses are counterfeit because someone is trying to manipulate them with confirmation yes. So it's a bullshit yes, counterfeit, it's bullshit. fake. Yeah, it's because guys. like, yeah. would you like to make more money? Yeah, okay. Would yeah. you like to have a better life? Would you like to travel the world for free and stay in five-star hotels? Yeah. Well, You're going someplace with this. You're trying to trap me with this. It's called a yes momentum or momentum selling. Now, there are a lot of people that'll say, yeah, I make deals all the time with yes. Yeah, just not as many as you could. You're playing at the 10% win table in Vegas, and I can move you to the 80% win table if you get out of yes. You can't tell me. That you, I can never tell you that you don't win some of the time. It's this best chance of success thing that I was talking about before. Just because it works doesn't mean it's best. What's the best chance of success? Since everybody's been flim-flammed and bamboozled with yes, then everybody gets immediately suspicious when you start getting them to say yes. There isn't a single group that I've ever been in front of when I've been trying to get you to get them to grasp. I said, you're on the other end of the phone. The voice says, have you got a few minutes to talk? What's your instant gut reaction? Everybody goes like, no. Of course. What do you want to talk about? What is it? What do you want? How much time? You know, what do you want from me? It's instant defense. Instant, instant yeah, defensiveness. Yeah. And I go like, all right, so that's your reaction. When you call somebody on a phone, what do you say? And I go like, oh, yeah. I hate picking up phone calls, by the way, for that reason. Yeah. So what do I do? So <laughs> what, what, what we all ask is, is now a bad time to talk. You get one of two answers. The act of saying no makes people feel safe and secure, which consequently clears their head. The act of saying yes makes people concerned about what kind of hidden commitment is there, what hook is there, and instantly creates anxiety. All you got to do is, is now a bad time to talk. And you get one or two answers. Having felt safe and secure, they'll go like, no, 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 I got 15 minutes. Or, yeah, it is a bad time, but I can talk to you at two. I've never had anybody not give me an alternative time. Yep. I need their, fo I need their focus. Okay. I don't, I, I don't need you taking my call when you're on a Zoom call. Right. Which is why I send a text message. It's now a bad time to talk. Or on the phone, or what I, I ask people, what have I caught you in the middle of? Okay. Because people, you know, they're usually in the middle of something, and so they can navigate it. I, I want to know what's going on in your world. What have I caught you in the middle of is an appreciation for your time also, that you might be in the middle of something, and so I need, I need to know what that is. So it's now a bad time to talk. What have I caught you in the middle of? But I'm triggering no constantly, I never, and then no across, across the board. Do you disagree? No. Is this a bad idea? No. Interesting. I'm, you just gravitate to say no. All of the questions. The good and bad of this is switching from yes to no creates such an instantaneous improvement of people's production, performance, closing ability, everything across the board, that sometimes that's the only thing they learn, which is a shame because you don't have, it's about triggering a decision versus actually listening. Okay. And on the first thing everybody that comes into my company, almost everybody learns no oriented questions right away because once they catch on and then they get an instantaneous improvement in everything they do, 
then they're addicted to it. And they don't really understand it's a decision-making trigger that's highly effective, which is separate from actually listening. Listening, which still has massive importance. Then that's a secondary move. And typically when they've been in the company for two, three months, then I will forbid them from asking me a no-oriented question. We're on, we're on a Zoom call with some people in the company probably about three weeks ago. One of our logistics people asked me a no-oriented question. And I go, all right, change that to a label. To a what? A label, which is a label is a sentence that starts with it seems like. Okay. It's a form of contemplation. It's reflection. It's thinking. It begins to create critical thinking. And she says, would it be a ridiculous idea for you to do X? And I said, okay, now make that a label. And she wasn't good at labeling yet. And I said, start with, it seems like. And I make her say the words. And she goes, it seems like it wouldn't be ridiculous for you to send that email. And the act of making her say that made her think about it. She says, wait a minute. No, she says, no, I think it's probably easier if I do it. And then the fact that another person on our logistics team was also on a Zoom call, it triggered her thinking. And she contributed a suggestion. Hmm. And between the two of them, they thought it through very quickly which then they realized they needed to take it off my plate. They needed to execute it themselves and how they needed to do it. So with the, the, the act of labeling triggers thinking. Mm-hmm. It triggers listening. And it triggers reflection, which is what you want everybody in your company to do, which is why then I move everybody in the company. I'm like, no more no to questions. Because I need you thinking more. So then ultimately, they get into a combination of the two. And that's the power. Now you're executing. Now you're thinking things through and you're triggering decisions. Okay. And those are two different parts of the brain. But you, they're highly complementary. But you got to learn one and then you got to learn the other. All right, listeners, take that to the bank. I just have a couple more for you, Chris, because this one really resonates with me. You say, do not back people into a corner. They'll disagree when they don't even right. want to disagree. Right. This is, if I'm being self-reflective, this is my biggest issue. And I want, I want your opinion on it. Here's why. If I feel that I misunderstood... What I have to, what I typically do is I over-explain and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put the PowerPoint out. Well, well, this is why, and this is why, and don't you see this perspective and this and this, and then I use the F word, which you always say, don't use fair. Wouldn't it be fair? <laughs> yeah, so bomb. this is where I mess up. I over-explain when I'm misunderstood that puts them back into a wall. When people are put back in the wall, you say, they'll say no, even when they want to possibly say yes. Right, right. What are some tips that I could use or anybody else at home could use when they're doing this? Well, yeah, I mean, and so your description of that is, is is a, a beautiful illustration of dynamic because you misunderstood means they're not listening to you. And you will not even have gone there if they've actually listened. I mean, actually listening. I'm talking to an extremely successful business person, Salt Lake City area, a couple of months ago, Randy Garn, great guy, hosted a screening of a documentary on my company. And Randy's at the point where he's got a lot more people doing deals on his behalf. And he says he and some of his business colleagues are watching their representatives do deals. And he says, we're watching these deals fall apart over miscommunication when the deal should be made. And most people, when you say miscommunication, will say, oh, people are not articulating themselves properly. They're not being clear. That's That's, what I feel. That's the big mistake. I said, is it miscommunication or a lack of listening? He says, yeah, it's a lack of listening. So the on- on- onus is not for you to state it more clearly. The problem in that communication was the other side wasn't listening to you. And they weren't confirming what they heard. 
And since they weren't confirming what they heard, your gut instinct is picking up the fact that they are not listening. Yeah. And you're finding that highly frustrating. Yes. And it's diminishing your desire to make the deal. Yes. Because you're not being listened to. So the problem there wasn't your lack of communication. The problem was good. Not, God knows what they were thinking about while you were talking because they weren't paying attention to you. So what do I do to get them to listen? You hear them out first. Okay. You know, it's kind of who goes first. Let me hear you out first. Because then the tremendous frustration that you were just describing, you got the complete opposite effect having felt heard. It actually, there's a neuro, neuro, neuroscience again. If you feel heard, here's what's going to happen. You're going, you feel heard, you feel bonded to me. You're honest, more honest with me. Yes. And some or all of your needs have been satisfied. You want less. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you hear somebody out? They're more honest with you. They bond with you and are, and are less greedy. They want less. What more do you want from a negotiation? You want Perfect. the other side to bond to you, be honest with you, and to, and to want less. And so the act, it's so counterintuitive and so powerful. The act of hearing somebody out, if, if I hear you out and you feel heard out, if the deal doesn't make itself on the spot, it moves so much closer to me that it's an easy thing to make if it was ever there. Got it. There's that 7% caveat. That's 7%. But if we're in the 93%, I don't want to work any harder than I have to. So, And I don't, want to, I don't want to concede anything I don't have to concede or trade off anything I don't have to trade off. So if I can make the deal by hearing you out, I'm going to hear you out. Brilliant advice. The last one I got for you before your trading secret, especially with the audience, 21 to 45 year old females, 85% base. Nice. A lot of feedback I get. This is this goes to relationships and business or interviews. I get ghosted. I don't hear anything back. I don't know how to ask for things I continue to give. In those right, scenarios, right. what tips do you have for the, the money mafia? Those are the listeners. That'll be the last, because I could sit here for another 24 hours and ask more tips. I know we can't do that. So this will be the last one I get from a negotiation perspective. What can they do? What can we do? Okay. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of, some people will ghost you on purpose because you start conceding. You know, the cutthroats do that. Most of the time, actually, ghosting is talking to you is doing no good. And if it's doing no good, it's doing no good for one of two reasons. You're not listening or they've lost power and influence. And it's usually a combination of the two. But them losing power and influence on their side of the table is usually the biggest one. If you're not listening to them, why should they talk to you? People communicate as long as it's productive. People will never stop communicating if the communication is productive. What stops it from being productive? You're not listening or they can't do anything on their side. So if you're being ghosted, it might be one of the 7% through no fault of your own. They can no longer make the deal. So there's no point conceding because they can't make the deal. So, some real estate agents will do this. They'll continue to cut their fees to the other side. is like, look, I, you know, they're going to do this for, for me for free, and which is a really stupid move. By the way, real estate agents should never cut their fee. That's mm -hmm. the reason why we put the book out, The Full Fee Agent. Real estate agents at full fee or a bargain. The best ones we've had on, the Jason Oppenheims, the biggest out there that have come on this show, every single one of them say, I won't negotiate my fees. Yeah, every one should. of them. If you can't stand up for yourself, how could you stand up for your client? Yeah. It's just silly. But if they're ghosting you, how, how, to, how to diagnose the ghosting? Send a one-line text, one-line email, one-line, one-line only. Nothing more than this. Have you given up on X and name whatever it is? You're going to get an answer within three to five minutes of seeing the message. Don't put anything else in. I was, I was counseling a, a close friend one time. I said, send a text. Have you given up on? And this person said to me, I sent that. I got no answer. Really? Show me the text person showed me the text and the text was 
Hey, Bob, how are you today? I hope you're doing fine. Hey, have you given up on? <laughs> if not, please reach out for me. And I said, no, 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 no. And the person said, well, you didn't tell me I could put the other stuff in. I'm like, but when I said one line only, because you just obscured the whole darn thing. One line, one line only. That seems abrupt to you, not to them. It's, it's, about, it's not about you. It's how it lands with them. They're saying no. No makes people feel safe and protected. Don't smoke screen it with all this other extra stuff. Have you given up on? They're going to get back to you in three to five minutes. Not kidding. This is, is get the highest success rate across the board. Now, if they don't get back to you at all, 7%. the answer is yes. Ah, an so no matter absence, what, you'll get your answer. An absence of a response is a yes. People hate to say yes. Silence to that is a yes. Move on. Mm. If they get back to you, now there's a further diagnosis. This person I was talking to, been, been ghosted for three and a half weeks since a previous obscured, have you given up on, sent that out person, gets right back. With a reason. Now, the reason was tragedy, personal problems, tragedy. I'm like, okay, so this is either a lie or it's true. Right. So if you express empathy for the tragedy. Sure. And it's true, you're going to get an immediate response. Okay. If you express empathy for the tragedy, not sympathy, Empathy. But empathy. So the response is, that's got to be really difficult. You're really going through a difficult time. Send that. If they're lying, they won't respond. If they're telling you the truth, they will appreciate your recognition for the difficulty and will respond immediately. No response to the second text. So I'm like, all right, so now you know what you got. You yep. got somebody who's being deceptive, who's lying to you. A lack of a response to actual empathy, not sympathy, is a big difference, is the diagnosis. Now it's time to move on because they're not going to make the deal. Which is an extreme red flag, right? Right. Lack of response to empathy is a To actual big empathy. Thing. Lack wow. of response to it is that the, the, the emotional situation that they're portraying is a falsehood. Ladies and gentlemen listening, that last five minutes will change your life. Go write that down. It will change your dating life, your professional life, your negotiating life, everything. Chris, this has been unbelievable. One of the world's most powerful negotiators is right here, right now, just dropping bombs with us. We so appreciate having you on, but we can't let you leave without a trading secret. You've given us a lot of secrets. You've given us a lot of trading secrets, but we need one more. Right. The Chris Voss trading secret. Can't find it in a textbook. Can't learn from a professor, even though you are a professor. Can't learn in the classroom <laughs> or Google. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What are you trying to say? <laughs> now I'm making shots at you. Right. One trading secret with Chris Voss. What can you leave, leave us with? Wow. You know, just, just practicing this thing that I refer to as labels. Seems like, sounds like, look like. Make a genuine observation. The more you do it, the more emotional insight you're going to have. Emotional intelligence is like unlimited. There's like no limit to the novelty and interesting insights that you can gain once you start to practice it. There's, it's kind of an unlimited skill. And you start getting good and reading people's emotions and then expressing your read and you're going to get to the point where people are going to say, I'm telling you stuff that I haven't told anybody in 20 years. Hmm. Those are cool conversations to have. Labels. It seems like, it sounds like, it looks like. Chris, thank you so much for being on Trading Secrets. Guys, that is one of the most powerful negotiators that has ever touched the planet. Chris Voss, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks where, for having me. And real quickly, we'll edit this in. Where can everyone find you and everything you have going on, Chris? Yeah, blackswanltd.com, B-L-A-C-K-S-W-A-N-L-T-D.com, our website. We got a lot of free tools there. The best free tool is really to subscribe to our newsletter, which comes out on Tuesday mornings, wherever you are in the world. 
whether you're in Baghdad or Bogota or Brooklyn. You get the email at 7.30 in the morning. You give us your email address. Concise, actionable, 700-word article. You can digest that baby on a Tuesday morning. Plus, the newsletter is a gateway to everything. New products, the website, new ideas, new concepts, new stuff that we have going on. And it's free. And you're going to get a long way taking the free stuff that we give you build a great foundation we got advanced training when you're ready for it if you don't build the foundation off the free stuff you're not going to be ready for the advanced stuff i like that and chris also has two books one never split the difference negotiation as if your life depended on it and another one that you just co-wrote in 2023 the full fee agent you referred to it in this podcast how to stack the odds in your favor as a real estate professional and if you need more chris go follow him on social media and his master class. And I also got a little trading secret. When he's traveling, he likes to go to the nice local steakhouse. So if you have a nice local steakhouse, go give it a visit. Maybe you'll run into Chris there. Chris, Amen. thank you for being on Trading Secrets. My pleasure.